I'm starting with a little warming up question before we give the, uh, uh, the question to you. Um, with the Congress, you decided uh, for the second time to use animation. Uh, would you generally say that this is a better way to, to express your visions or will you decide this from script to script? And my second question would be, uh, how did you decide to move on from Bashir to, to this kind of animation? <coughs> well, um, animation is, um, on, on one hand, I think it's very addictive for a filmmaker because you can really explore it and you can really feel the freedom to do whatever you want to do. <clears throat> so you, I mean, for example, you can't really imagine the rebels going over Abraham in that direction, I couldn't do it. And in animation there was an option. And of course, all the psychedelic parts were great for animation. On the other hand, as uh, I think a few people here in the audience know, because we work here in Hamburg. It can turn into, I mean, slavery. Honestly, it is so tough doing classic animation. It's unbelievable. And as a filmmaker, I think you have to be either really stupid or brave to do it for the second time in a row. Then I guess I'm both of them. So uh, I got addicted to it. And one project before Watson and Machine was a TV series. I used animation. Then I decided to do a fully animated film and I did Watson and Bashir. And then I said, okay, this time I'm gonna challenge it and I'm gonna do half and half. And the biggest challenge is gonna to be to go with the actors and on one stage after an hour of live action movie, um, the leading actress is gonna break an ample sniff it and become an animated character, like her whole world. <clears throat> and of course, the, the biggest goal was to make the audience follow her from being a, a human as they know her to being a, a kind of cartoon. And still, they walk with her. And it's, it's, an easy, it's, it's, a, it's a tough task to accomplish. There are uh, very many, uh, well, many cartoon celebrities in it. How did you uh, choose the ones you take in? And also, is, I mean, if you put a Tom Cruise in animation, do you have to ask him, or how does this work? Well, uh, I, I, I can't really... Um, uh, I can't really say it's Tom Cruise. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, from my point of view, he never participated in the movie, obviously. Um, <laughs> I mean, animation, basically, if you don't say, you don't say it, um, you can do whatever you want. As long as the studio manager sits in his office and says, this guy outside cost me a fortune, you know, I paid two, two bucks for your contract, and you don't say who's the name, what's the name of the guy, you can make it from Obama to Tom Cruise, no worries. The good thing about it is that my agent in America is a Tom Cruise's agent, and we walked, <laughs> and we walked out of the cinema in, in Cannes after the premiere. Asked her, "What does she think? How will he react if he sees it?" And she said, "He will never, never recognize himself." <laughs> so, so if he doesn't recognize himself, I can, I can recognize him. Did anybody recognize himself and had a reaction on it? You mean if Yoko Ono called me to say that it's a real girl? No, she did not. Well, uh, when we came to that stage of designing the, the, the scene in New York, um, we had a meeting in the studio and I asked each, each and every one of the designers to, to bring his names because I wanted them really to have fun illustrating the characters. I brought my list, they brought their list. And uh, in the end, like any um, any democratic dictatorship, I decided. But uh, a lot of it, a lot of it came from them, to be honest. Maybe 
one last for me. Uh, um, and the visuals are very stunning, of course, in the Congress. But uh, for me, uh, also a big part of the movie is uh, the sound and the music. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about probably the composer, the, yeah. the sound, and also maybe the, the song uh, I like so much, Forever Young? Yeah. She asked it because she knows they're all German. So, uh, what? <laughs> um, the, the composer is Max Richter. Oh, yes. He's German. Yeah. Uh, Max Richter. Uh, it's the second time we work together. Uh, it's pretty amazing how I met him in Waltz of Bashir. I wrote the script really, really fast. It took me four days. I was stuck in a hut in the Galilee and I wrote the script and I listened only to his three albums. Max's albums. I didn't know him. And, uh, very depressing albums, of course. Film, depressing films as well. And then uh, when I came back home with the script, I thought this guy basically composed the script because he was there when I wrote it. So why won't he compose the movie as well? And I searched him in Google and I sent him an email. I'm this guy from Israel making an animated documentary film. He composed the script, sound really weird. And he thought I was a weirdo and said, yeah, if you want to, you can come over. I live in Edinburgh, that's where you live back then. We never discussed it in the phone, on the phone, nothing. I came there, I showed him the, still the video board, the animatic. And he, uh, he wrote the music, because for me it was essential the animators. While animated the movie, they will be hearing the final score. So we had the score way before we had the movie. Because I wanted them to feel the environment, and the, the style, and the atmosphere I want to have in the movie. This time, um, it was less innocent, I would say, more complicated, uh, the whole process. And uh, the classical music was recording the, with the Babelsberg Orchestra in Berlin. And I mean, I think that when you work with a musician, uh, it's like love from first sight. If he takes the material that you give him and... and uh, if he takes the material that you give him and if he's really attached to it, if he understands it, it will take him a few days to make the first sketches. If he starts sweating on it and it becomes really tough, you know that you're lost. It will never happen. It has, it has to be a match, an emotional match between the, the filmmaker and, and, and the musician. And sometimes the musician can be a really great one, but if he's not connected to the movie, there's nothing you can do. Happened. And the sound team is the same team I worked with previously um, from Berlin. Uh, the mixer Lars Ginzel and the designer Naomi Hempel and, and the dialogue editor uh, Adrian Bumeister. For me the sound, the sound, when I come to do sound in Berlin for six weeks, the post, uh, it's the, it's, I call it the, the corruption of the, of the whole production, because um, I basically do nothing. You know, they're so talented. I sit in the back of the room. The room is fantastic. I take one or two decisions a day. And uh, we have a fantastic sound here. It's called Dolby Atmos. Um, I think in Germany you have only two or three screens with the Atmos. It's a fantastic system with 48 speakers, uh, 18 of them on the ceiling. It's, uh, it's amazing. You're completely shaken. But most of you will never hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any comments or questions from, from you? Please. Don't be shy, don't be shy. It makes you swap and write for the main character. Are there any questions you understand? Yeah, okay, we have to repeat it because it's so big here. Uh, so the question was, uh, 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 how did uh, you choose Robin Wright? Well, the preliminary choice was, uh, I, I wrote the treatment about Kate Blanchett. And we already had illustrations of her and everything. And uh, I always thought that she's too perfect for the role, because she's too perfect. Um, she's the real winner, you know. She, gained everything in a very young age, and she runs this theater in Australia, and uh, she directs and she writes, and she's a superwoman, and I didn't need really a superwoman in this movie, honestly. 
<clears throat> and one day, I, one night, I attended the ceremony in LA, my previous film. It was the LA Critics Award, and Robin was sitting with her ex-husband, just on the opposite table. And uh, I, I thought she was stunning completely, and I already had the, the first scene written with the tracking out from the actor's eyes, with the monologue of her agent, and I could see that shot with her. She was very sad that evening, and very beautiful, and very vulnerable, and very emotional. And because of the time difference between LA and Tel Aviv, I text my guys who work with me, and they already illustrated her. It was morning in Tel Aviv. And by the end of the night, I approached her, I pitched her the project. I had on my cell phone already her illustrated, as if I was prepared for a year. And, uh, Honestly, she committed immediately. It was the, the most easiest thing I did in this movie was to convince her to take part. Really. And she's a great partner, a very, very clever woman. She also did some songs, huh? She performed some songs in it. Yeah, and she sings the, 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 both songs, um, the covers for Forever Young and If It Be Your Will. I don't know Cohen, she sings them as well. find people that are very talented. And first I want to I want to thank the, the local film fund, which is called I thought, see, Film Filero Hamburg, yes. And for supporting this movie. And because we supported the movie, we could work here in Hamburg in Studio Arkete and, and this is a special thank to Lana Ball and to Stefan Hellman. Stefan, are you here? Stefan is here? No, Jana is here? Hi, Jana, how are you? Please stand up. <laughs> and a special, special thank from our studio to Anne Sophie. Is Anne Sophie here? Thank you, Anne. Yes, and of course, from, from the fund, uh, Eva Hubert, we met in Sarajevo, and Malika as well. So thank you for the support for this weird movie. <laughs> and uh, since you don't ask questions, I can just keep talking until the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what happened, and our stories. But anyway, this film is an adaptation of the Stanislav Lem novel. He's my favorite sci-fi writer. He's a Polish guy like me. Uh, he wrote this novel in the late 60s, and it was an allegory about the communist era in Poland. And he set it in uh, Southern America in a place called, it's an imaginary place called Costa Ricana. And I read this, uh, this book uh, for the first time when I was 16 or 17. I was a sci-fi buff. I was, although my wife doesn't believe me. Uh, and I, I loved, the, back then I really, of course I was impressed by the trippy elements and the druggy elements because I was completely stoned, but when I grew a little older, when I came to film school I could see the layers, I could see the, the, the layers of the literature, which was fantastic. And I could see that it is talking about free choice and about identity and about a lot of things that you have to be a real prophet to, to predict in the late 60s, which reflect our lives today. And I always wanted to adapt this novel, but I didn't know, I didn't have a clue how, how I'm gonna do it. When I started working with animation, it was 11 years ago, I already had a clue, a little clue, what I wanna do, but still, I forgot about it. I became really busy with Walter Bashir, which was a film I didn't plan, it just happened to me. When I finished Bashir, uh, which was uh, 
It was a good period of my life, but traveling with the film was very, very demanding and very tough. I was very lonely. I had to speak about myself for nine months, about my memoirs. And it was, uh, it sounds funny, but it's not funny. You can laugh, but it's not funny. And I knew when I came back home that I want to run away from everything, from, from the film, from everything that happened with it, from myself. And I came back to the left story because I thought it was, it's going to be the perfect escape route for me from Wax of Bashir, and I will not be caged in the success of that movie. I thought it's the complete opposite. And I optioned the book, and I still didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew that I want to combine live action and animation, and I want to challenge it. But I didn't know about the live action a lot. I knew that the animated part is going to be extremely influenced by the novel, and it is. We have uh, scenes from the novel who are completely copied from the book, like uh, the panic attack Robin is having at the hotel and uh, the towing institution and uh, her arrival to New York. The voiceover of her is something that Lem wrote in his very own words. But the first part, I didn't have it. And then a few years ago, I was in Cannes in the market, in the Cannes Film Festival, and I met my sales agent there, and there was a, an old lady walking there, and he asked me if I can recognize her, and I didn't. And he told me her name, and I was completely stunned because she was this huge goddess actress, an American actress from the 60s and 70s. And I found it stunning that she walks in Cannes, which is probably the mecca of cinema, and nobody recognizes her at all. Just to think that 30 years earlier, she was, she was I mean, the queen of the event in the same, in the same place. And I was amazed, and I, uh, as every writer does, you know, I tried to be her, and I, I, I tried to figure out what does it mean that she walks there in, in, in this place and she's no one. She's just no one. And this same feeling that I, I wanted to, to understand, I, 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 I put it in the, for me it's the key scene where she arrives at Ab Abraham and she's walking into the hotel. And her son asks her, hey, Ma, do, do, do they recognize you? And she says, no, I'm just an old lady to them. And meanwhile, you have uh, all those trailers running around, and in the trailer, she's forever young. And this was the, this, this one frame, one picture, one image that I wanted to capture, that I saw in my very own eyes, and I wanted to do it in the animated part. And from then, from this point, I had to go backwards to see how it all happened, how she came to this place as an old lady, and she has to confront the fact that they're keeping manufacturing her and her image for every young. And this is where the idea of selling your image came to my mind. And the whole beginning of the film became at Miramon Studios. And slowly, I built the whole structure of the, of the movie. How, how long took that from the first uh, idea to the final it took me eight months to write, to write it. For me, it's a very long time. I'm a fast writer. The, it, was, uh, it was very challenging. When you create a sci-fi film, you have, to, you have to set all the rules of the world that you're creating. And when you're asked many questions by a script editor and people who work with you, it helps you, but one day, I told them, listen guys, I'm building this structure, it's like a house, you know, if you want to challenge it, you will find a lot of holes in the net, you know, not everything, it's not like a formula, there are things, there are gaps that the audience will have to fill up with their imagination as well, it's not science, it's science fiction, but it's not science, because you have to create the whole rules of the world that she's coming to after 20 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's much more complicated than just writing the, the contemporary drama story.
I honestly think that Cody, the, the guy who plays Aaron, is the biggest star in the movie, in America at least. Uh, and his future is ahead of him. I mean, this, this boy is really extraordinary. First, the way he looks and, and on the camera and on the screen is unbelievable, his features. And he's so clever and so precise. Just for an example, that when we finished shooting, he told me, only when we finished, that the whole time, every scene that he participated in, he had an earplug that the sound recordist gave him, and the sound recordist was, was transmitting, you know, like nasty sounds, disturbing sounds in his ears, while he was taking his monologues and dialogues, in order to get the feeling of the Usher syndrome. And it was his idea, he thought that I wouldn't agree, so he just did it. <laughs> you know? And this is how he, he, he was on the set, and it was like a small earplug, I didn't notice it. And this is how he performed the whole time. He's really great. I'm sorry. I just, Last question. I just okay. didn't mean the, only the writing. Uh, I meant uh, from the first idea to the premium. Um, it took um, four and a half years everything. The live action part was shot in LA, in Germany, in Berlin and in, in Cologne. And it was the easy part, by far. The animation part was done in six different countries. In the beginning, it ended up with nine. And uh, as people who sit here know, it was a very, very tough production. Sometimes they wanted to kill us. You guys don't come to them. But we survived. <laughs> yeah, great show. Okay, we have, because the next show is starting. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you all. Yeah.